Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Vitru in Physique. Thank you for stopping by. Today I have an informational video on a popular question that I've been getting asked a lot in my email, my YouTube comments. Um, this is simply going to be um, some tips, some do's and don'ts for your first bodybuilding or men's physique or fitness in general competition. I remember when I was considering my first bodybuilding competition, everything seemed very easy. You know, I thought, hey, I saw a pumping iron, I'm ready to go. And then when I actually started looking into it and, you know, um, the preparation, finding a contest, all these things, it got kind of um, complicated and it took a lot of trial and error and personal research and Googling a hundred things. So I thought I would just, you know, break it down for you guys and, uh, you know, try to make the, the whole process a little bit easier. And I think I'm going to, you know, give you some tips which will apply to absolutely everyone, um, young, old, um, men, women, whether it be bodybuilding or physique. On a physiological level, we all work more or less the same way. So like I said, I think these tips will apply to absolutely everyone. Also, some of you guys may be wondering, who the hell is this guy? Why does he think he's got the credentials to give me advice? And you're right, but allow me to elaborate. Um, I have 10 years of training experience. Um, I've been competing for two years, and during which time I've competed in three competitions. And I'm happy to say that in men's physique, I have never finished outside of the top three. Um, in my last competition, I actually finished first place and I have qualified um, for the Ontario Provincial Natural Championships um, twice. So I don't in any way claim that I know everything and that I'm an expert, uh, but you know, I do know a couple things and I have done the research both online and you know, just myself, I've got a lot of experience you know, doing these competitions. So I think that there's a lot of stuff you can't really you know, find through books or articles or Googling it, you just have to experience it through word of mouth. So I thought I would put this video together and without further ado, let's get started. Topic number one, preparation time. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Giving yourself adequate time to lose body fat. Okay, according to these numbers, I need to lose about 20 pounds in 20 weeks, so a pound a week or so. Bad idea. Thinking you can go from Fat Albert to friggin' shredded in seven weeks. What's up guys, this is Fat Guy Physique. I've got about seven weeks to lose 25 pounds. I think we can do it. Guys, this is probably the number one mistake I see um, new competitors um, struggling with because so many people are, you know, in a sense, overly optimistic with the amount of fat or weight they could lose in, you know, X amount of time. Lots of times we hear this 16 week standard, you know, I hear it so many times like, oh yeah, you know, four months to cut down, eight months to bulk, repeat every year. And um, I think this comes a little bit from, I, you know, the IFBB, um, guys like Kevin Leroni and other bodybuilders who would cut down for competitions in a matter of months. You know, there's something like two to three months they take uh, to prepare for the Mr. Olympia, which is one of the biggest competitions in the world. And then some people think that they could do the same. I don't know where, but I've heard this 16 week standard mentioned so many times. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that there's a lot of factors you have to consider. Number one, um, you know, how lean are you? Because, you know, everybody um, will require a different amount of competition um, preparation time, depending on what body fat percentage they are starting at. Those IFBB guys may be starting, you know, pretty, you know, damn lean with a good six pack already showing. So they may only need 16 weeks. Also, you have to understand that some of these guys, you know, in the IFBB who are advocating 16 weeks or less aren't performance enhancing drugs. There's nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely fine. But you know, you as a natural athlete, usually natural guys require a little bit more time to lose body fat without losing muscle. Um, so you just have to apply, you know, a little bit of discretion when comparing the two. Okay guys, so what you are seeing here is my competition prep this year. As you can tell, I started, you know, at around 205 pounds back in January, coming down to about 169, 170 all the way in August. And you can also see the equation, which is the slope up in the corner, which is 0.1271x. That's actually the amount of weight I lost on average per day, which if you multiply by seven for a weekly um, weight loss rate, I guess you want to call it. It's about 0 0.90 pounds um, per week. So as you can tell, you know, like even one pound per week was a bit aggressive estimate for me. So I telling you guys, you should really understand that, you know, don't overestimate how much fat you are going to lose and how fast you're going to lose it. In fact, this period right here, um, that's when fat loss kind of plateaued for me because I went on vacation, you know, or injuries happen. So I'm just telling you guys that you're going to be cutting for a while. A lot of things are going to be thrown at you. You could get sick. You could get busy with this, that, you know, who knows? 
Also, understand that fat loss will be a little bit accelerated in the beginning, as shown in this example graph, and then it starts to plateau near the end as it becomes harder and harder and harder. You guys have to understand that some of these examples, you know, in the industry, such as, you know, Jeff Syed, for example, I heard that he actually cut for his first competition in two weeks. Well, that's because here's a picture of him, you know, walking around normally, and the guy's already completely shredded. Um, Christian Guzman took about, I think it was 13 to 14 weeks, which is a bit shorter, but again, in his offseason, he was a little bit leaner. Matt Ogus is kind of the opposite. It. I mean, he took a long time, 25 to 30 weeks, um, because, you know, he was definitely, he had a fluffy offseason, nothing wrong with that, as long as you give yourself a little bit of extra time, obviously it paid off, and, um, you know, this way he's, he's able to retain a lot of muscle mass. Even if hypothetically you've done the math, and you have, you know, decided to take a fairly aggressive approach uh, in terms of a caloric deficit, and you think you can lose X amount of you know, fat in X amount of time, I would actually advocate you to extend that a little bit more because this way you could retain as much muscle mass as possible. Us natural guys, like I said, um, will usually lose some muscle mass during a competition prep. It's just unavoidable. This is a side effect that you have to accept and get used to, but we can, you know, cushion that a little bit. So if you decide to lose, let's say 30 pounds of weight um, in 16 weeks, That'll probably, you know, I'm pulling these numbers out of my butt, but um, that could turn out to be about 20 pounds of fat loss and unfortunately 10 pounds of muscle loss. It's kind of drastic, but for the purpose of this example, let's go with that. Let's say you extend it and you start your cut a little bit earlier or you decide to do a little bit of a later show and you do 20 weeks of dieting, you may actually lose, let's say the same 30 pounds of weight, but it's 23 pounds of fat and only seven pounds of muscle. So in this case, you're losing more fat and you're keeping more muscle, you're gonna do a lot better. So guys, I would, you know, patience um, is a virtue. Topic number two, choosing an actual organization. Um, the first thing I wanna mention is if you're a natural guy, I would advocate that you choose a natural show. That means a natural organization like the IFPA or the INBA or NGA, I forget the name of them, uh, in the States. Here in Canada, we have things like the IDFA, which I competed in, I had a good time. Um, or you could compete in an open organization such as the OPA in Canada or the NPC in the States, but sometimes these organizations will have specifically natural sanctioned shows and in that case it's the same thing. Now I'm not saying 100% that you know in these natural organizations or these natural shows that you're going to get 100% natural athletes. Unfortunately there are people out there who may not have the same morals, but I think the propensity for not natural guys to show up will be a lot less because they're scared of getting, you know, they're scared of getting busted or tested or they just have decent human morals and they don't want to you know beat up on someone who's like half their size because they're not on stuff um so yeah like i said try to compete in natural shows also is the organization reputable if you go on their website does it seem like they've been around for a while they have a lot of people who are you know associated or compete with them or does it seem like they have some creepy website that was made on microsoft paint by some seventh grader and it looks like you know like a 12 year old's facebook page you know you can kind of tell um, also, make sure you, you know, if you decide on a competition or a show, go and look at the actual results from last year, see how many people competed, what caliber of athletes they were. The last thing you want to do is show up and it turns out you're the only guy, which actually happened to me. And it kind of sucked to be honest because, you know, you're standing up there and you're like, yeah, give me my gold medal. I competed against no one. And it's essentially an empty victory. An interesting fact is some organizations will differ dramatically. When I competed in the OPA, my um, men's physique show was packed. We had like 30 guys and like, I think 14 or 12 guys just in my height category. So it was very competitive. And in the same show, the bodybuilding category was absolutely empty. I was like the only one competing in my division. And it's just, it's interesting because it's such a disparity between the two. So make sure you go and look because you know, it might be the opposite. Some cases, you know, some organizations have very popular men's physique divisions and not popular men's, you know, bodybuilding or vice versa. When I competed in the IDFA, it was, you know, 50-50. We had five guys in bodybuilding, five guys in men's physique. Smaller show, but, you know, five guys is still fairly competitive. And yeah, nobody wants to be standing up there by themselves. It's not fun. Topic or piece of advice, number three, put money down ASAP. Guys, I do not know why, but when it comes to humans, for some reason, we take everything a lot more seriously if we have something riding on it namely money. So when I competed on my first show, I decided, you know, I've, you know, I've thought about competing for years since I was 20 years old, but I actually did it when I was 23 because every year I'm like, oh, I'm not shredded enough. I'm not big enough. And I never put the money down. So I thought, hey, you know, if I decide not to do it, I could just pull out. Giggity. Guys, if you're going to decide to do something, decide to do it for real. Don't go in with like 50% intentions because you're always going to be like, eh. So I highly recommend that if you decide to go into a show, the first day that registration for that show opens up, even if it's like four or three months down the road, 
put money in, even if it's like a hundred bucks, for some reason, we will you know, take it a lot more seriously once we actually have something riding on it. Also because it kind of makes the whole experience real. As a first time bodybuilder, like, you, know, always, you always think you're gonna get on stage, but it never really happens. But when you actually put money in, when you actually have a completed registration, that's it. This is no longer a pipe dream, this is happening. You've got, you know, start the countdown. You've got four months to get shredded, get your speedo and get on stage. Guys, topic number four, always prioritize conditioning over mass and size. Um, conditioning wins shows nine times out of ten I find in my experience and you know from looking online um, the more conditioned guy so you know more lean less body fat um, he will beat competitors who actually may be you know a decent amount of size um, bigger than them now I'm not saying you know show up as like a completely shredded 140 pound at six feet tall twig and like you've never lifted a weight in your entire life but you're shredded to the bone you've got striations on your face but at the same time if you guys you know show up like a big marshmallow and you're thinking you're so big and massive and strong like hey guys i'm 200 pounds beef cake beef cake then you're going to be in for a rude awakening when you find out that guys who are 30 pounds less than you at the same height are beating you an example i think which outlines this in application not just theory is my first competition i did not come anywhere near as conditioned as i should have and the guy to my right beat me he had a great physique he was big he was shredded he beat me fair and square at my next competition, I was able to bring up that conditioning up to a pretty reasonable level. I think I was one of the more conditioned guys at the show. And interestingly enough, that same guy was actually there. So you can almost like, you know, call it a rematch. Unfortunately, he was not able to bring in the same level of conditioning, partly because um, he did get sick um, a few weeks out from the show. So, you know, it's not really a fair comparison, but just to, you know, outline how much of a difference conditioning, not just size, but conditioning uh, will make. Um, he actually ended up finishing seventh and I came third, even though he had a decent amount of muscle mass on me because that's what conditioning can do. And the guy who finished first was kind of like a fusion of both of us. He had pretty good conditioning, uh, similar to me, but he had the size of the guy who finished seventh. So that's what wins shows. But if you can't have that, if you're not big enough, you know, if you don't have that kind of structure, at least settle for, you know, impressive conditioning because that will still, you know, help you place top three. Topic number five, should you get a competition prep coach? This is an interesting one because when I was competing back in August and I was talking to some of the guys in my show, you know, backstage, I found out that I think I was one of the, if not the only guys who actually didn't have a coach. For those of you guys that don't know, there actually are people out there who as their career will coach people throughout a competition prep to get them in, you know, potentially the best possible shape um, that they can be. This is through, you know, diet plans and kind of like monitoring uh, macronutrient adjustments, cardio adjustments. They pretty much just like, you know, watch them and essentially coach every single, you know, physical aspect of their life to dial it into the best that they can be. And I believe this is extremely valuable um, for two reasons. If you are uh, new to bodybuilding, new to lifting, let's say you've only been doing this for like a year or two. Um, number one, it's kind of like an insurance policy. You know, if you're putting in this much time, effort, uh, you know, hard work, and you know money in some cases you want you know you want that extra piece of insurance to make sure that you come in the best possible shape that you can and number two i believe this is a very good learning experience so i you know if i advise you guys if you do get a contest prep coach which is a fantastic experience and you know i'm sure it'll be an invaluable asset make sure you don't just sit there like a robot and does whatever he tells you to like uh-huh okay carbs uh-huh no there's no point at, at that point you're just a robot and let's say you decide to do another competition next year you're gonna have to do this whole process all over again um, i implore you to actually ask him why am i doing this why do i need this many carbs what's the point you know physiologically uh, or through your experience why do i need to do this and what results will this have that way that you know you can get as much out of it as you can and that next you know next year or the following years or whatever if you decide to do another competition prep, you will not need their help again. I believe that you know coaches and personal trainers, although they should be there to help you and dial you into the best possible physique or health you know, status or whatever that you can, at the same time, they should equally put as much emphasis into teaching. Um, I don't like it when people just spend 10 years training someone because essentially, like, are you saying that after 10 years, that person is still incapable of doing it themselves? you're a pretty crappy teacher. But if you know your body well, you are well averse in topics like calories, um, counting macros, macronutrient ratios, adjustments, uh, peak weeks, if you decide to do that, sodium, water, whatever. Um, in that case, you know, I did it without a coach and I think I placed pretty good coming in top three and actually winning my last show. 
So, you know, I'm a walking example that, you know, competition prep coaches can definitely help if you're new to this, but they are not everything. And if you're somewhere in between and you're kind of contemplating it, but you know your stuff, it's really up to you. One thing I will want to point out though, is that this can get very difficult and sometimes it is hard to stay on track. And sometimes you do need someone there in your ring, you know, in your corner who can kind of support you. And I'm saying both on an emotional and like psychological level and on a you know knowledge level. Because let's be honest, you know, our significant others, our friends, our family, they may be invaluable sources of motivation and psychological support, but they may not be the best sources for, you know, physique adjustments and critique. Thanks mom, I'm over here trying to get strided glutes. I don't think the judges are gonna care that I'm mommy's special handsome boy. Topic number six, posing suit. This one's pretty simple, um, cause in the case of men's physique, it's simply board shorts. You can find these at any store or online. I usually get the Hurley ones. Make sure you get them in a very simple color, like, you know, black or blue or green or whatever. No fancy design, sometimes they don't like that. Um, try to minimize the pockets. Also, um, you have to make sure that they're the required length. In my organization, they have to be at or below the knees by like one inch. So just look up whatever your individual organization um, requires. For bodybuilding, I usually go for the conservative um, style Speedo or posing suit, whatever you want to call it. I actually just go on Amazon and find, you know, men's Speedo swimsuits. I got, them, I got a black one for like 30 bucks or something. Of course, I have to get the 6XL, if you know what I mean. Giggity. And yeah, I prefer the old school, you know, Arnold-esque conservative um, posing suit. I don't like these new ones with all the colors and the glitter. They're kind of like too shiny and fancy and frilly. They don't look like posing suits. They look like something a rapper would wear as bling. Okay guys, topic number seven, tanning. This one is also pretty simple. Um, the first thing I highly recommend is go get yourself a bottle of ProTan. It's kind of like a spray on tan. Um, you can get it on bodybuild.com for like 20 bucks. Um, so you spray this, you know, this brown liquid on, then you have someone rub it in. Um, you let it dry for like 30 to 60 minutes, you know, walk around, try not to touch anything. Then before you go to bed that night, you wash it off. Like 50% of it's gonna come off, the other 50% is gonna remain, and it's gonna sink in and give you a very nice, very dark, but natural looking tan. I recommend you do like two to three layers of this over two to three days. So if your show was like Saturday, I would put on a layer Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. When it comes to your real competition tan, you usually have two options. Number one, which has become the industry standard and is by far the most popular option, is spray tanning. So pretty much you get like a kind of a pod thing, and then you have someone like a professional spray tanner, I guess. Um, they come and they cover you in a coat, and usually they do one the night before the show and then one early in the morning of. And also they give you a you know, adjustments throughout the day, which is nice in case your tan starts to come off a little bit, they can, you know, update it to make sure it looks okay. Um, the second option has really been getting a lot less popular recently, partly because some organizations actually don't allow it. Um, this is Dream Tan. It's kind of like a tanning paste, which comes in a jar. It's a lot cheaper than the spray tan, but like I said, it's not as popular. Um, so pretty much you apply it over your body and it's gets you very dark, but at the same time, it actually has posing oils built into it, so you're very dark, but at the same time, you're very shiny, and you can get a pretty good look. I actually used this for my first competition, and I think it turned out pretty well. A lot of organizations don't like it anymore because everybody ends up looking the same. This stuff can smudge and smear very easily if you start sweating, and also, there's a lot of problems when athletes, you know, touch stuff in the venue or the hotel, and a lot of people get very pissed off. So, Choices are up to you, but if you want to be safe, just go with the spray tan, dish out the 100 and 150 bucks. And finally, guys, the final and most important, and I do not take this lightly, um, topic when it comes to your first competition, what you eat um, in the final 12, 24 hours before a competition. This is going to play a vital role because you would be surprised how people can make or break their physique depending on the foods, macro and micronutrients they consume. Here's what I advise, and some of you guys may wanna write this down. If you take nothing else from this video, take this. You should probably consume a meal that consists of about 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrates, 20 to 40 grams of protein, 20 to 40 grams of fat, those two aren't as important, and 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of sodium. Now the carbs and sodium, those are the two most important points. The reason you do this is because your body by now, if you've been low on carbs and you've been dieting down, or at least I hope you've been dieting down, <laughs> Um, you're probably very lean, very shredded, but you're very flat. You kind of look like a deflated balloon. So the reason that you take a high carb and high sodium meal is that it allows you to kind of inflate back up like a balloon. And it's interesting, bodybuilding shows is kind of counterintuitive. You want to be 
inflated in your muscles, but ripped and lean in your fat. And it's very hard for your body to do two things at the same time, which are, like I said, counterintuitive. So this meal kind of helps us do that. As you increase sodium, your body starts to pull water back into your muscles, which will allow you to kind of inflate. In addition, as you increase carbs, you know, it's such a drastic amount of carbohydrates, 100 grams of carbs. Some people eat 100 grams the whole day, and now you're eating 100 grams just in one meal. So all that carbs is gonna start to replenish and increase your glycogen stores. Glycogen is just a fancy way of saying long chains of sugars or polysaccharides. Uh, this is a molecule which um, sits inside your muscles, and because you've been low on carbs, your glycogen levels are low. Glycogen actually holds, retains, binds, whatever you want to call it, water. So increase carbs, increase sodium, and your muscles kind of just swell and fill up and you look like this big shredded Superman. And I'm not saying it's going to like, you know, make your physique a hundred times better, but potentially it could, you know, make you go up one or two placings if you're lucky. And also another thing which um, I do and a lot of people do is they start to have a lot of simple carbohydrates. When I say simple, I mean things like candy legit i was eating like oh henry bars and fuzzy peaches or rice cakes rice cakes and jam are very popular um and they do this in like hourly increments before your show in fact before i was going on stage 30 minutes or even 10 minutes before you know going on stage i was eating these simple carbohydrates and then i was pumping up and this really gets like you know blood rushing into the muscle and it's going to increase vascularity because of all the sugar that's rushing into your body it's going to help you get a really good pump and that's, you know, that's what we want. On stage, we want to be like pumped up like a big balloon with all this carbohydrates and all the sodium and all this water rushing into our muscles. And some of you guys may be wondering, oh, well, you know, what are you doing? Aren't you going to get fat? No, it's too late. You're going to have all the water, all the sodium, all the carbohydrates in the world. It's not going to affect your body for at least 12 to 24 hours or whatever. So the next day, yeah, you may look like crap, potentially. But right now, it's too late. You're just going to swell up and look like a big shredded Superman. It's going to be friggin' great. And yeah, so that's it. So if you take one thing away from this video, let it be this. And that brings me to the end of my video. So guys, I hope you learned something. And if you are considering competing for your first time, I highly recommend you do it. Win or lose, it's a fantastic experience. And you will be, a, it is like crack cocaine. You do it once, you're gonna wanna do it again. Like the next day after your show, you're, you're already like looking and starting to prepare for your next one. I guarantee it.